Submarine down. A submarine has failed to surface when scheduled and presumed to be in trouble. The operations officer checking the operations board finds that her surfacing report is now 15 minutes overdue. This is serious. Communications cannot be established. She will not answer her radio call. The squadron commander is notified at once so that immediate and energetic steps can be taken to come to her aid by a complex network of ships, aircraft, and shore stations. The submarine search and rescue plan set up for this emergency is put into effect. All units involved know their jobs and are ready to carry them out the minute the word of the disaster is flashed. Every available means is taken for just one purpose. Find that submarine and prepare to get her crew out fast. But meanwhile, what about the men in the submarine? What can they do? There are two chief means of escape from a sunken submarine. Individual, SEA, and collective, the rescue chamber. This film will show conditions in a sunken submarine and how to escape by these two methods. This is the after torpedo room of the sunken submarine. These men are in plenty of trouble and they know it. At the time this submarine went down, there were no officers present. The senior man is Baxter, torpedo man first. It's up to him. First, the smoking lamp is out. Those cigarettes will foul the air and burn up valuable oxygen. Next, there's no immediate danger, so the sensible thing is to sit down and be quiet while Baxter checks all angles of the situation. No answer. The line must be cut. No luck with the MC either. You're isolated, Baxter. The responsibility is yours. You've got to make all the decisions and make them right. You have seven men besides yourself depending on you. Don't let them down. The port shows the next compartment clear, so the door can be undogged and one man sent forward to check conditions while Baxter, considering all factors involved, feels it advisable to release the marker buoy. Under poor weather and sea conditions, or if their position were not known, rather than releasing the buoy, the men would attract attention by sending up oil slugs, floating debris, sea markers and flares, and by tapping on the hull, especially at night when the searchers rely on their sound gear. The two forward compartments are clear. Good. That's more air available. All decisions will be made by the senior man, Baxter. But it never does any harm to talk over the problems with experienced shipmates. As the leading torpedo man, Baxter knows his compartment and knows his job. But it's always wise to check the emergency bills so that no important steps will be forgotten. The air purification formula shows it won't be necessary to bleed in any additional oxygen for quite a while. We better pass down a canister of CO2 absorbent to keep the concentration of CO2 in the compartment down. The instructions say to spread this on a mattress cover laid on a lower bunk. CO2 is heavier than air, so keep the absorbent down low. Also, this absorbent is a mild skin irritant. Put on rubber gloves to avoid direct contact. Pour it 
out carefully to prevent powdering. And spread it in a thin layer to expose maximum surface and to obtain maximum absorption. Now the escape bill. That is the big decision, how to get out. Well, we're pretty safe here, for now. There is no immediate danger and we have plenty of CO2 absorbent. Emergency drinking water. Food and fruit juices and ample supplemental oxygen. It looks like the smartest move is to do nothing. Just sit here and wait. All right, men. You're all experts at grabbing sack time. Now is the time to prove it. Just lie down and take it easy. We're going to stand fast right here until they come and get us with the rescue chamber. No unnecessary chatter. No unnecessary moving around. If you want water or chow, see me. One man should stay awake and listen for the ASR. And that's all there is to it. These men have made a wise decision. Escape by the rescue chamber is the safest, surest way. No danger from drowning, from exposure, or from having no vessel to pick up survivors. No chance of oxygen poisoning or decompression sickness. Whenever there is a choice, take these three basic precautions. Keep the air as pure as possible, keep the men resting and quiet, and then wait for the rescue chamber. But in the forward torpedo room, it's a different story. They have a chlorine leak. Salt water has reached the batteries and a ruptured seam is allowing deadly chlorine gas to seep into the compartment. We can't stop the leak. Break out the SEAs and pass them around to all hands. Rig them as respirators by removing the canister caps and pulling the cellophane wrappers off the flutter valves. Get those mouthpieces between the teeth. Open the neck valves and pull those goggles over your eyes. Those SEAs and those goggles have containers of soda lime which will filter out the chlorine to protect your lungs and eyes. Let's get that buoy up next. Now to check our position. Depth not quite 100 feet. Water 58 degrees, not too bad. Prepare for individual escape immediately. When circumstances such as these indicate escape by SEA, it is essential to carry out the plan as promptly as possible before the confinement and gradual falling of the air have a chance to weaken the men. The first item on the escape bill is to rig the compartment and trunk. Since it is impossible to talk with a mouthpiece between the teeth, the lieutenant must make all his communications by gestures. Here he is signaling for four men to break out the inflatable life raft pictured here. Other men pass emergency gear up into the trunk. Buoy and ascending line. Diver's knife, battle lantern, hand tools, and spare SEAs. The 225 pound air supply valves are unlocked and tested. The oxygen lines are blown down to clear them, and the oxygen regulators are set at 60 pounds over bottom pressure. Everything is in order, so the lieutenant briefs the first three men, making sure that one has a short piece of line which will be used in sending up the life raft. Okay, up you go. 
The men remove only their shoes, keeping on the rest of their clothes as a protection against exposure. The life raft package is passed up into the trunk and is pushed over to one side. while the third man climbs in and dogs down the hatch. Since the air in the trunk is also contaminated with chlorine, the 225 pound air supply is opened to ventilate the trunk to the forward torpedo room. When the air in the trunk is purified, the vent to the forward torpedo room must be closed. Then the mouthpiece and goggles may be removed since the SEAs are no longer needed as respirators. But that canister cap must be replaced because the SEAs will next be used as escape lungs. To be sure everything is ready, the SEAs are checked over one final time. One man undogs the trunk door all the way, but that door can't be opened yet. Outside sea pressure is holding it sealed tight. So in order to equalize inside and outside pressure, one man ducks down, opens the flood valve and starts flooding the trunk. As the rising water compresses the air, the men breathe in a normal manner to equalize the air pressure in their lungs with the increasing air pressure in the trunk. To prevent ear block, they close the mouth, hold the nose, and blow. The trunk is rapidly flooded until the water level reaches the top of the door. Here one man adjusts his goggles for better underwater vision and closes the canister valve. That canister will filter chlorine and other gases out of the air, ventilating the goggle, but it won't stop water. So close the valve or you'll have salt water in your eyes. With the valve closed, the man ducks down and swings the door open. For purposes of clarity, these scenes are being photographed in the training tank at New London, Connecticut. While it is not considered dangerous to breathe oxygen at depths of 100 feet or less during escapes, to be on the safe side, the man is holding his breath, ducking back into the trunk whenever he needs more air. Here, after feeling around for obstructions, he returns to the trunk. During this period, the trunk may be ventilated with the 225 pound air supply to keep the air respirable. Next, one man takes the buoy and ascending line and streams it from the trunk door. He pays out the line steadily until he feels slack, indicating that the buoy watches. He then returns to get the diver's knife, which was stowed in the trunk at the beginning of the escape. And getting a secure grip on the bite of the ascending line, he cuts away the excess. In actual practice, the excess line and reel would be thrown under the superstructure well clear of the escape trunk to prevent any possibility of the line unwinding and fouling the trunk door. The ascending line is then secured to a pad eye outside the door. On a submarine, this pad eye is located nine inches above the door. During this time, the man is buoyant, so he must take care not to float away.
Now we're ready for the life raft. The man who brought up the short piece of line ducks out through the trunk door and hooks this piece around the ascending line, bringing both ends back into the trunk. They are tied around the handle of the life raft package. The life raft may now be pushed out through the door where it will float to the surface of its own buoyancy. The man follows and watches to be sure it didn't foul the superstructure. If at any time it is necessary to communicate with the compartment below, the men may do so by tapping on the hatch using the signals listed on this brass plate mounted on the trunk overhead. And now we're about ready. But before starting, remember these important words of caution. If life depends on it, the SEA can be used for escapes from as deep as 300 feet. However, pressures encountered at such depths greatly increase the hazards. So thorough indoctrination and maximum care are necessary for success. Foremost among these hazards are oxygen poisoning, which produces convulsions. Although oxygen is safe to use at depths of 100 feet or less in an escape, Breathing the high partial pressures of pure oxygen at greater depths can be dangerous to fatal. However, if air is used to breathe and to charge the SEA at depths over 100 feet, the danger of oxygen poisoning is largely eliminated. Anoxia, or lack of oxygen. Tests have shown that the compressed air breathed by men at depths to 300 feet contains sufficient oxygen for the average ascent, provided there are no undue delays after the SEA has been charged. Decompression sickness or bends. Experience with divers indicates that while decompression sickness is a problem, it is generally not serious because of the comparatively short time the men are under pressure in a well-executed escape. Excitement and confusion can intensify these hazards to the point of disaster. Strong leadership, clear heads, and calm execution of the escape are absolutely essential to success. The escape party is now ready. The first man checks his oxygen supply valve, takes a few breaths underwater to be sure that it's working properly, then gets a final charge and ducks out. He seizes the buoy line and begins his escape. After a 10 second interval, a second man will start his ascent. Escape with an SEA is not difficult if a few simple rules are strictly followed. Grasp the line with your fingers locked outside and your thumbs inside the line. This way, if the line is lost, it will probably stay inside your encircled arms. Arch your back with the head well clear to prevent your mouthpiece or goggles being kicked off by the first man's feet. Hold the ascending line between your feet and allow yourself to float to the surface at a steady rate of about one foot per second. As demonstrated by this training tank instructor, do not hold your breath. Breathe through the mouthpiece a little harder than normal, but be sure to exhale. Holding the breath will build up internal pressure and can rupture the lung walls with serious and even fatal results. If the legs should slip from the line and float out, air will be spilled from the flutter valve.
However, the SEA will again work correctly when a vertical position has been regained, although there is some danger of anoxia if too much air is lost. If at any time you lose your mouthpiece or it should fail to work, simply resort to free escape. Purse the lips and blow as if whistling. It is usually necessary to exhale continuously to equalize the pressure of compressed air in the lungs with the decreasing outside water pressure. If a feeling of fullness in the chest is felt, it means that more exhalation is necessary. This instructor is showing how, if the line is lost, to slow your ascent by spreading the arms to act as a brake. To return to the escape party, when the last man is ready to leave, he taps on the hatch to signal to the men below that the trunk is empty. When the officer in charge of the compartment hears this signal, he alerts the next group of men. Since there is no life raft on this trip, four men, the normal capacity of the trunk, are selected. Allowing about 30 seconds for the last man above to be clear, the trunk door is closed from below. Then the water is drained from the trunk by either blowing or dumping into the torpedo room. The lieutenant makes a final check of the escape party. And the first man climbs the ladder to undog the hatch. The trunk is now ready for the second escape party. One man who has shown himself to be cool and calm in this emergency is designated to be in charge. These men will now exactly follow the steps of the first escape party who should now just about be breaking the surface. There's the first one. It took him about a minute and a half to come up that line. And of course, between his lungs and the SEA, he had plenty of oxygen. That raft will be a big help now. To inflate it, he has merely to pull that ring and the cartridges of compressed CO2 will do the rest. There's the second one. Now the big thing is to get together and stay together. It's all too easy to become separated, particularly at night or in rough weather, turning a potentially simple rescue operation into a disaster. Watch out for sunburn, roll down your sleeves, keep covered and prevent it. And that's it. By understanding the equipment involved, the SEA and the trunk, and by training in underwater techniques, these men have each made a successful individual escape. This film has presented submarine rescue from the submariner's point of view. When there's no need for emergency action, follow the provisions of the air purification bill. Stay quiet and wait for the arrival of the rescue chamber.
But if for any reason you can't wait, then make up your minds to get out and get out promptly. That calls for a cool head, know-how, and training.